The first reading is taken from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, um, verse 16 until the end. It's page 1166 um, of the Bibles. I've been humbled already this morning while you're finding that. Isaac Firth saw me, and he saw me wearing a suit, and he asked me, was it my wedding? <laughs> so, obviously, I'm normally a bit of a scruffy brute. Anyway, um, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 16 um, to 33. I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. But if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I am not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting um, in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools, since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit we were too weak for that. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading follows on from the first and can be found on page 1166 of the Church Bibles. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. But I will boast about a man like that. But I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pled with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just pray as we stand. Um, Father, we pray that you would change our hearts, continue to work in our hearts, so that we truly are people who want to boast in Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection. Gladden our hearts again today as we come under your word. Help me to speak clearly. And Father, I pray that your name will be lifted high 
um, through the teaching of your word and that we would go out wanting to obey it and willing to submit to it in your name. Amen. Please sit down. Right, well, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that probably most of you um, in the room know who this is. Is that Scott? No, no, it's a, it's a good try. You know, it's not a young John Emerson ready to hit the town. Um, <laughs> this is a Dr. David Banner. Um, he is a widowed physician and scientist. He's presumed dead, and he travels across America under assumed names and finds himself in positions where he helps others in need despite his terrible secret. In times of extreme anger or stress, he transforms into a huge, incredibly strong green creature who has been given the name the Hulk. Or so Wikipedia says, anyway. Um, I actually used to love watching that program because um, you knew it was all building up to Hulk time. It was all building up to the moment um, when David Banner went super size and he just blew the bad guys away. Well, today in 2 Corinthians, we get to Paul's Hulk time. Um, he's already reasoned, persuaded, and pleaded with the Corinthians. He's desperate to keep them safe from the self entitled super apostles who are threatening to wreak havoc amongst them. And as we read this heartfelt letter, we should be getting more and more impatient because we know that Paul is the real deal and we know he loves the Corinthians and we know he's walking with God. Why won't he just go supersize himself and get rid of these frauds for good? Come on, Paul. The situation is extreme. The situation is desperate. It's time to go Hulk. There's an urgent and unavoidable need in this passage, for Paul to boast. Now, we're very uncomfortable with boasting. Surprisingly, though, there's quite a few examples of boasting in the Scriptures, and particularly in 2 Corinthians already. However, here, Paul is desperate to avoid the appearance of boasting about himself. He's desperate to avoid dishonoring God by even threatening to claim any glory for himself. As Scott said last time, Paul's not particularly concerned here with defending himself, but he is desperate to protect the Corinthians. He's desperate to ensure they remain devoted to Christ. What do they need protected from? Well, just look back in chapter 11 there um, to verses 3 and 4. Paul writes this, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the snake's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. There were false teachers there, and they were preying on the Christians in Corinth. And these so-called super apostles, they are preaching about a Jesus. Um, they are preaching and speaking about a spirit, um, and they are trying to spread a gospel. But it's a different Jesus. It's another spirit, and it's an alternative gospel. Um, and it's a message that cannot and will not save its hearers. And yet, it's a message that some of the Corinthians are at risk of accepting. You see, the false teachers look attractive um, and as a result, their message seems attractive too. But make no mistake, um, this attractive gospel will leave people standing before God the judge with nothing but their own righteousness to count for them. You see, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel will not save. C.S. Lewis writes this in the screw tape letters. The safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. The only hope for any of us in this building, um, for anyone in the history of the world, the only hope is the authentic Jesus who took the penalty for sin upon himself and who rose again triumphant. Another Jesus will not do. The stakes for the Corinthians are supersized 
And so Paul has no options left. We saw Paul fighting last time with weapons that are not of this world. And now Paul, he's only got one weapon left. And even then, he stalls and he stalls before finally taking that plunge. Just look through verses 16 to 21. So verse 16, I'm being a fool. Verse 17, I'm talking like a fool. Verse 18 to 20, you put up with fools so easily, so I have to be a fool to get through to you. Verse 21, I'm speaking like a fool. There is a huge reluctance to start down the road of boasting. There's constant warnings that this is not normal practice. But there's a realization that if the Corinthians are going to stay devoted to the real Jesus, then they need to see the effect that the real Jesus has on the true servant of Christ. Say that, I'll say it again because I think it helps throughout the whole sermon. If the Corinthians are going to stay devoted to the real Jesus, then they need to see the effect the real Jesus has on the life of a true servant of Christ. Paul set out tests last time for counterfeit teachers. And now he's going to finish that argument by showing us some marks of a genuine servant of Christ, some vital marks of a genuine gospel ministry. Who should the Corinthians listen to? Who should they imitate? What should they expect from the genuine servant-hearted Christian life? What should they praise God for when they see evidence of it in their leaders? Get on with it, Paul. Go Hulk, go supersized and cut these super apostles back down to size. It's time to boast. But what will the subject of Paul's boasting be? See, for the Corinthians listening, who were so attracted by the false teachers with their persona of success and their bold claims, Paul's boasting starts off pretty well. Let's read verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Oh, Paul's just like the super apostles. That's great so far. I mean, we like Paul. He's a great bloke. If you just tone it all down a little bit, if he would just be a little bit more like the world around, if he could just be a little bit less countercultural, then we wouldn't even need these other blokes. So far, so good. But it goes downhill pretty rapidly. Let's read on. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Hard work, prison, pain, injustice, discomfort, danger, disrespect, death. They are super-sized struggles. This is supposed to be boasting. The Corinthians reading this want Paul to show he is more successful than the false teachers, to prove that Paul and not the false teachers are worthy of their devotion. You see, if you like the look of the super apostles, all success and shine, etc., you won't like this list at all. We often want a more comfortable Paul than this. Is Paul too intense? Is he an extremist who sets impossible demands? Why do we want to tone Paul down? Well, it's because we want a more comfortable Jesus. Why does Paul boast about struggling? Well, it's a very familiar um, passage, Mark 10, 44 and 45. Don't look it up. You can just listen to it. But that's what it says. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why does Paul boast about struggling? Jesus struggled. Hard work, pain, injustice, discomfort, danger, disrespect, prison, then death. 
Jesus came to be the servant of all. Paul can only boast about his struggles because they are the way of Jesus. A more comfortable Jesus would be a different Jesus, and it would not be one who could save us from our sin. Jesus sweated blood in Gethsemane because there is only one way. It's not my will, but yours, he said. You see, if the, if the Corinthians reject a struggling Paul, then they're rejecting the suffering Savior. Struggles are a huge, huge mark of a genuine servant of Christ. Who should the Corinthians listen to? The successful super apostles or the struggling Paul? There's no competition. Who should we listen to? Well, I've just picked three from Paul's list of struggles. Hard work, discomfort, and disrespect. As I watch our leaders in this church, I am constantly thankful that they work themselves way past discomfort and often towards weariness. Open homes, open lives, huge amount of work going into sermons, Hectic schedules, wives and families that pay a willing price. As I watch them stand firm on the authority of Scripture so that they invite and withstand scorn and disrespect from the media, from our bishops, from politicians, I thank God that he has put them here in this place. Should I listen to them? They have chosen a path of supersized struggling. And that is the path of the Jesus that they serve. What a mark of genuine ministry. What about us? What struggles do I have to boast about? What struggles do you have to boast about? There's no other Jesus. We must follow him down the road of suffering. Supersized struggles, they're followed by a supersized concern for God's people. Let's read verses 28 to 29. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? What a genuine love Paul has for these Christians. It's a concern that forces him to his knees daily. It's a compassion that saps his strength. It's a depth of feeling that causes him inwardly to burn It sounds amazing. Do you want your leaders to love you like that? Are you sure? Because it is this love that led Paul to write letters full of challenge to his wayward readers. It is this love that will force Paul to confront them with hell so that they flee to Christ. It's this love um, that means the leaders in this place will never ignore sin and pretend that doesn't matter. It is this depth of feeling um, that demands repentance and insists upon church discipline. See, we often want a softer love. It's a love that's not really a love at all, but more like approval. And it's because we want a more approving Jesus. The super apostles, they wanted the approval of men. And because they had no real love, they ended up exploiting and taking advantage of the gullible Corinthians. Why does Paul boast about this concern? Again, don't turn to it, but in Jesus' prayer shortly before um, the cross, John 17, 15, he says this, my prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Paul can boast about this concern because it comes from the concern of Christ. Jesus interceded and intercedes still for his people. Protect them from the evil one. Paul boasts of this concern because it's another mark of the true servant of Christ. It is more evidence that the real spirit is at work in Paul's life. So who should we imitate? Do I burn if those around seem careless and lukewarm? Do I rebuke, encourage, challenge, plead with, and pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ? Or am I happy just to give and receive approval so that no one's offended and no feathers are ruffled? How costly really is my love for others? How costly is your love for others? Because there's no other spirit. 
We are to be truly united in a real, costly, loving concern. So Paul faces supersized struggles, just like Christ. He has a supersized concern, just like Christ. And thirdly, he boasts of a supersized humility. Can somebody boast about their humility? I wasn't sure about that before I had to prepare this sermon. Um, But let's read verses 30 to 33. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. What a humiliating picture. Paul, with his rights as a Roman citizen, with all his learning, with all his experience of bearing up under persecution and pain, Paul in a basket, running away and slipping through the governor's hands. That's not the sort of boast that's going to inspire more people to want to associate with you, to stand up for you, to speak well of you. In one of the commentaries I read, that the writer explained that one of the Roman soldiers' most glorious achievements in battle um, was called the Corona Muralis. There you go. I'm an Irishman trying to pronounce properly. Anyway, the Corona Muralis. And that was awarded for being the first over the wall of a besieged city. Now, that is something to boast about. Not hiding in a laundry bag and tiptoeing away from the fight. Paul should have kept that one quiet. But then he goes on to speak in a very vague way about a man he knows who had the most amazing spiritual experience. Just read verse 3 to 5 of chapter 12. And I know that this, I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Paul speaks about this person in the third person. Um, But it becomes clear that he is the one that heard these inexpressible things. He is the one who has been in God's very presence. For 14 years, he has been quiet about this momentous event. I reckon we would have been quiet about it for about 20 seconds. 14 years, and then even then, a refusal to talk details. A refusal to tell things he was not permitted to tell. Look, where's the boasting? This is dynamite. I mean, this is exactly the sort of stuff that might just top the claims of the super apostles. But instead, Paul moves straight on to verse 7. Because of the, uh, or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Paul speaks loudly about his trip in an escape basket. He speaks as quietly as possible about a trip to paradise. And then he starts to shout about a thorn that is tripping him up even now. Can someone boast about their humility? Yep. Well, why? Why boast about humiliation? Again, you'll know this passage, Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul boasts because he serves a humiliated Christ. He boasts because the gospel he presents, the only true gospel, is one that speaks of Jesus making himself nothing and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul boasts about his weaknesses and his thorn because long-term, genuine transformation shows Jesus' glory far more clearly than any one-off spiritual experience ever could. Let the super apostles boast of their uh, great triumphs in the spiritual realm. Paul believes that a far better mark of genuine ministry is the humility that comes from being united with a crucified Christ. Earlier in the letter, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, again, just listen. He says this, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
Transformation into Christ-likeness trumps everything else. You see, we want a Paul who makes much of his success. And I think that's because we want a a Jesus who makes much of us, um, who makes much of our needs and makes much of our desires. And I think that's because we find it very hard to imagine that we are not actually the center of the world. But what should we expect from the genuine, servant-hearted Christian life? We should, be, we should expect to be humbled by our weakness, by our circumstances, by God's purifying hand. So in what ways am I foolish in the sight of men so that Christ is exalted? In what ways am I happy to be thought of as a fool so that others can be brought to a saving faith in Jesus? There is no other gospel but the one that is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Constant Christ-like struggles, consistent Christ-like concern, and continual Christ-like humility. There shouldn't be any doubt in the Corinthians' minds that Paul is genuine, that his ministry is genuine, and that the gospel that he has drilled into them is the gospel. And there should be no doubt in our minds as to the type of leaders that we're going to listen to, um, as to who we should imitate, as to what we should expect from a life of service to God. But how does Paul sustain this servant-hearted life? I mean, where does he get his ability um, to boast in these ways from? Let's read verse 8 and 9. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power uh, may rest on me. Paul shows a supersized dependence on God. Now, I'm glad that he's not specific about the nature of the thorn in his flesh. And if you're interested, you can go away and research the alternative theories. But for me, it's brilliant that there'll always be some doubt Um, because it means that none of us are left out or can opt out here. Physical sickness, mental illness, whatever terrible struggle you can think of, of, it means that all of us can and should um, include our own trials in this verse. Paul does neither of the things that so many of us are prone to do when we face difficulties in life. He doesn't resent the thorn thinking he has so much else to do, and what can God be thinking, giving him this extra huge issue to deal with? And he doesn't ignore the thorn with some sort of case or ass or attitude. You know, that's life. What else can you expect? There's no point in complaining. Instead, Paul throws himself at the feet of the God he knows to be in total control. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Paul has willingly faced so much And yet here he pleads with God. And the answer he gets is an answer that God has for every single one of us. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul avoids, not just to avoid complaining or to get on with things despite difficulties. No, Paul resolves to boast all the more gladly about his weaknesses so that God's power may rest upon him. I think that every one of us here um, should learn this verse until it is a natural or maybe a supernatural reaction in times of great trial. Times when we are tempted to avoid the struggles that come with following Christ. Times when loving others feels like too much of a sacrifice. Times when we desperately long for others to make much of us instead of the God we serve. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Supersized dependence. Now, if you're not a Christian here today, I, I reckon you're probably thinking how terrible real Christianity sounds. But if you belong to God, then you will already have experienced to some degree how Paul feels in verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All of these struggles and difficulties have forced Paul to flee to God. They have forced him to realize that despite his great learning and understanding, despite his natural energy 
and zeal. He is absolutely powerless by himself. His resources are finite, and at some point he will crash and burn. So what amazing, extraordinary, supersized delight there is when we see that it is in our very weaknesses that God acts to show his strength. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And what strength there is in our creator God. Paul delights in all these weaknesses. He truly delights in them because without them, he would live on his own strength and he would become a proud, hard-hearted man. He'd be the sort of man who would follow the false teacher's pattern, full of pride and self, happy to manipulate others for his own good and ultimately destined for hell. How does Paul sustain this Christ-like life? It's not despite his struggles. No, it is in this godly struggling that Paul comes to truly delight in his Savior. How do we get this delight? It doesn't happen by itself. Paul makes that clear. Instead, it is the result of a life filled with supersized struggles, supersized concern, supersized humility, and supersized dependence. A life like this will bring you real, lasting, genuine, affection-capturing delight. Now, in conclusion, I wonder how this all makes you feel. What should we expect from the genuine, servant-hearted Christian life? Struggles, concern, humility, dependence, delight. Who should we listen to? Let's give God thanks that the leaders in this place um, are ones that we should listen to. Let's pray that they continue um, to live like Christ for our good. How can we imitate this? And for me, this is the big one because it feels impossible. But let's take Paul as an example. What, what was he? He was the enemy of Christ, um, the enemy of his people. What has he become? He's become a servant of Christ. And why? Well, because of God's grace, because this is what God does. He transforms. He transforms supersized sinners into super saints. So Christian, take heart, waken up, Take up your cross and follow the real Jesus. Christ struggled for you. Christ loves you deeply. Christ humbled himself and gave everything up to redeem you, to transform you, to prepare you for eternity with him. Get on your knees in your weakness and depend upon his strength. Depend upon him and you will come to delight in him, to delight in struggling for his honor to delight in loving his people, to delight in making little of yourself so that you make much of him. Praise God for his grace. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we, we know that we are, have nothing of our own to boast about. And yet we want to have things to boast about. Father, we want to be able to boast about Christ, truly boast about his work and his life and his love. And so, Father, make us people who listen to your word, who put it into practice with your help, with the help of the Spirit, who submit to it, um, and who are marked out by the struggles that we have, the love and concern that we have, and the humility that we have. Father, make us people who depend upon you and people who truly delight in you. Amen.